Hello, welcome back to the fourth week of Consider This, a new series where we simplify the COVID-19 conversation. I'm Marianne McDowell. And I'm Heidi Beidinger. And today we've got guests Jack Swarbrick and Trisha Balia. Jack is the director of Notre Dame Athletics and Trisha is a law professor here at the University of Notre Dame, but also the chair of the athletic faculty board. And so today we're gonna to be talking about uh, the impact of COVID on athletics here at the University of Notre Dame. So things like protocols and testing and decision-making and economic um, impact. And we'll introduce them shortly. Um, but first, as a reminder, our goal for this webinar is to help our community to understand the public health and science as it relates to COVID. We hope that you're finding the tutorials and the videos and other links that we uh, upload prior to each session. If you haven't checked them out, please do. We have also had a request that we answer all of the questions that get submitted. Um, and we are slowly making our way through those. And so if you look back at the previous sessions under additional resources, um, you should be able to find them. And as a reminder, you can email us at any time at consider at nd.edu. I also wanted to remind everyone that the views that were presented here are the views of Heidi and myself and our guests and are the official views of the University of Notre Dame. Um, and sometimes we'll be talking about health information, but you shouldn't uh, interpret it as specific uh, health information to yourself or specific medical advice that supersedes the medical advice of your own practitioner. So last week, um, we had a fantastic conversation about the effectiveness of masks and the public health uh, implications with doctors Mark McCready, David Layton, and Mark Fox. Um, it came with um, uh, demonstrations. They brought along props and um, plastic shields and masks and demonstrated um, how uh, the COVID virus might be transmitting. Uh, transmitting. Um, but if you missed it, don't worry, we've got it posted on our Think ND webpage. And um, also, as a reminder from our first show, when we had um, the provost on, um, I want to encourage everyone again to please register for the COVID-19 registry that's open to all Indiana residents, positive or negative. Um, it helps us to learn more about what's happening with COVID-19 in our community. Um, so that link is on our Think ND page. And so now here we are in week four of our series. So let's introduce our guests and welcome them to the show. There we go. Hey, Trisha. Hey, Jack. Hi, Trisha. Hi. Hi, Jack. Us. Good Howdy. to see you guys. We are so pleased that you guys are here. So these are our two guests um, for today, Jack Swarbrick and Trisha Balia. I'm going to read a, just a brief intro um, for both of you, and then we'll jump into it. So Jack is the vice president and the James E. Rohr director of athletics. He was born in Yonkers, New York and raised in Yonkers and Bloomington, Indiana. Jack is a 1976 magna cum laude graduate of the University of Notre Dame with a bachelor's degree in economics. And upon graduating from Stanford University Law School, he accepted a position as an associate in the Indianapolis law firm Baker and Daniels. He was made partner in 1987 and spent 28 years with the firm. Jack became Notre Dame's 12th athletics director on July 16th of 2008. And he and his wife, Kimberly, are the proud parents of four children, Kate, Connor, Cal, and Christopher. That's awesome. Trisha is the William J. and Dorothy K. O'Neill Professor of Law at the University of Notre Dame, and Trisha earned her A.B. summa cum laude from Harvard University in 1991, where she was elected to Phi Beta Kappa. Uh, since 2009, Trisha has served as the chair of the university's faculty board on athletics, the principal advisory group to the president on educational issues related to intercollegiate uh, athletics. Trisha teaches and researches in the areas of constitutional law, administrative law, cyber law, electronic surveillance law, and copyright law. She is co-author of a leading cyber law casebook and has published several articles on internet law and separation of powers. Uh, she joined the Notre Dame faculty in 2000 and has also served as visiting professor at the University of Virginia Law School. Welcome, welcome, welcome to you both. We're so looking forward to this session. 
Great to be with you. I think I think Trisha's athletic background got shortchanged there. She, oh, was, a, she was a varsity athlete in uh, in college. What sport did you play, Trish? Trisha? I played tennis. I played tennis as an undergraduate. A lot of fun. Awesome. In contrast, in contrast, my athletic background did not get shortchanged in the end. <laughs> <laughs> Duly noted. Do you still play tennis, Trisha? I do. I do. I'm going to play when we're done tonight. So, oh, oh, all right. <laughs> I guess we should get started. Thank yes. you so, so much for uh, agreeing to, to be on our show. Um, I've really enjoyed working with you both on the faculty board in athletics and have been so impressed with all that you do, not just for our student athletes, but also the university at large. Um, so let's get started. We, Heidi and I like to hear, and we think our audience likes to hear, uh, how people got where they are, uh, what you do specifically, and, and what brought you here. And so we're hoping you'll each talk a little bit about that. And I think we'll start with you, Tricia, and including tell us a little bit about what you do academically. Sure, so I've, as, as Heidi said, I've been here on the faculty now, gosh, it's my 20th year. Um, my husband is also a faculty member, so we kind of came together to Notre Dame. Um, I, as, as she said, I teach constitutional law, administrative law, as well as some technology related courses. So this semester I'm teaching administrative law. Um, and for the last 10 or so years, I have chaired the faculty board on athletics. And I, I came to that role. It's, it's not something that I've taught in. It's not an area that I ever really thought that I would get connected with um, as a university professor, but I was, as Jack said, uh, a student athlete as an undergrad, and it was a really formative experience for me. Um, I really enjoyed it. I wasn't the greatest <laughs> on the team, but it, it taught me a lot. It gave me great friendships and, and really actually turned out to open some doors for me, even in my career going forward. So um, you know, fast forward, when I was on the faculty, a, a, a spot came open to serve on the faculty board in athletics from the law school. And so I, I did that. And then a few years later, Father John asked me if I would chair the committee and serve also as our university's faculty athletics representative to the NCAA and to the ACC. So that for me has been putting me sort of half time teaching the law school, half time working with athletics and, and really um, the goal there is to, number one, provide good advice to Father John and to others about matters at the intersection of athletics and academics. Um, we keep a close eye on how our student athletes are doing, what kind of academic support um, they receive, what admissions look like, looks like for them, you know, what resources are we providing. So, so that, as well as trying to just make sure that the student athlete experience is is what we hold it out to be, you know, um, what does that look like on the ground? How many classes are they missing? You know, what kind of support do we have for mental health? All those kinds of things are things that we talk about um, and have an opportunity to work on not only as a university here, but also more broadly in intercollegiate athletics generally. Mm. It's all, and you've been a fabulous chair. I was, I was served on the board under other chairs and you're by far the best, I think. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Jack? Can you give us uh, some insight in how you got here? Sure. Uh, as Heidi's introduction suggested, I was practicing Manifest Destiny 10 years on the East Coast. My family moved to Bloomington, Indiana. My father worked for the Otis Elevator Company and they built a plant there. So uh, we, we moved to Bloomington and then through um, really odd circumstances, which are beyond sort of the scope of the time we have available here, um, I quite unexpectedly wound up at Notre Dame, much to my delight. And then uh, upon graduating with an economics degree, I was uncertain what one did with an economics degree. So I went to law school. That seemed like the logical thing to do and, and went out West. Trish has heard the story, but um, as I contemplated my law school options, I, I went to the counseling center on campus, then in O'Shaughnessy Hall, and uh, got the brochures, the, the course brochures for each of the a law schools I was considering, and uh, Stanford's had a palm tree on the cover, and that's how we decided to go to law school at Stanford. Um, went there, um, anticipated staying out west, um, but through a very influential conversation with um, Holy Cross priest, Father Tom Stella, who I had met while at Notre Dame, and he was uh, doing some graduate work in Berkeley at the time, 
um, I decided I wanted to come back to the Midwest and so decided to take uh, an opportunity that was available to me in Indianapolis. My arrival coincided with the city launching a major economic development uh, program around amateur sports. There are very good reasons for that. The Amateur Sports Act had recently passed in Congress and it created a, effectively a new Olympic sport industry. So Indianapolis decided to capture that industry, not because I had any particular interest in sports, but because I wanted to be engaged in the community, I became a very active volunteer with that initiative. And through that met a lot of the leadership in the Olympic and collegiate sports world because we, we hosted their events. I mopped floors and passed out towels and did all kinds of stuff. Eventually those people started coming to me with legal problems. Um, I was a labor lawyer and litigator and loved doing it, but one request after another led to the position where I decided I should pursue that full time. And so my community life was built around amateur sports and then my professional life became focused on it. And I did that for 25 years or so until out of the blue, I got a call from Father John one day and a, a classmate of mine, by the way, who I never met, uh, while I was at Notre Dame. And uh, we uh, decided to have a conversation about um, my potentially doing this job. And I was so struck by him and his vision for the university that uh, while it, I went into the meeting thinking I didn't want to be an athletics director, I came out of it committed to do this if he had an interest in, in hiring me. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> That's quite that a story. On, yeah. I was on the board under another athletic director and I'll say the same thing I said for Tricia. You've been awesome. <laughs> well, thank you. It's a it's a privilege to work with the people I get to work with. The best the best students and the best faculty. And when I say faculty, I include our coach educators um, in the country. And so uh, my job is not to screw it up too badly. They're, they're they are so capable and, and and so committed to doing this the right way. Yeah, well, that, that brings us to, um, we take uh, email questions and, and comments prior to the session. And uh, as you might imagine, we've had several that kind of centered around the decision to have uh, fall sports, compete in fall sports. And so I just would ho was hoping, Jack, you could talk a little bit about uh, the, you know, all the things you considered uh, to opening fall sports, uh, not in, and not just football, but football in particular. Um, and I'm sure everybody would like to hear what kind of evidence went into that decision making. Sure, thank you. Um, I, I'll, I'll start by saying that I, uh, I authored an op-ed piece in the, that appeared in the Wall Street Journal on this topic. And I've, you know, the audience, if they hadn't seen it, I, I invite them to, go online and look it up. Uh, if, you've, if you've participated in that process, you know that um, an essay you're very proud of gets boiled down to what'll fit on the page. Um, and, and so there were some things that came out of it, but I was glad to be able to articulate publicly why we did what we did. It started most importantly with the decision to return to in-residence education at Notre Dame. Um, when Father John articulated that decision uh, in, in, in a piece he wrote, um, he talked about all the value of being in residence and the impact we have on each other when we can share ideas and learn from each other in a classroom. Because of the way we view athletics, that was a charge to us, to me personally, to see if we could do it in athletics. Because if the university was returning and returning to the classroom, I needed to see if we could activate our athletic classrooms. And that's what our practice fields are and our gyms and ice rinks. They're, they're places where our students learn great lessons of great value to them as Tricia alluded to her own athletic career. And so we started feeling like that was the objective um, to see if we could match the university's plan, if you will. And then we engaged in a host of things. Um, First and foremost was understanding what the students felt. And so we spent a lot of time talking to them, uh, surveying them, listening to them. And we, we got a pretty clear message that they were very eager to return to athletics if, if we could do it. 
Uh, next was the health and safety dynamic. That played out largely through a medical advisory group of the ACC. Um, each of the 15 schools appointed typically a physician, sometimes a scientist to this working group, medical advisory group at the ACC. And it has been a phenomenal resource for us. All of our protocols are established by that group. We, we have the university's protocols we have to be mindful of, but then this group establishes independent protocols, um, some more rigorous than, than the university or the county health officials or the CDC. Um, and, and so we became convinced through that very active process that there was a way forward that we could, we could participate safely uh, if we, if, 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 as safely as we could under the circumstances, uh, if we chose to do that. Next was the commitment of all 15 schools. We wanted to act together. Um, th there's an important obligation you have when you join a conference, and this year, as everyone knows, we're fully in that conference to try and participate with the other members in, in decision-making and, and in coming to a common ground. The presidents carried the lead on that. They had a lot of discussions. Eventually, they came back to us and green-lighted uh, the effort. Then it became about day-to-day -day, uh, learning and implementing, and we always went into it. We never made a decision to play fall sports. We made a decision to, to practice the next day. Every day we were gonna revisit the question and see how we were doing and look at the opportunity to play. And I'm really glad we did that. We learned a ton. A Couple of conferences made a different decision. And I think frankly, they lost the ability to learn from that on a daily basis when they shut down completely for a while. They've since restarted. And so we, uh, we, we got ourselves to a place where we were comfortable. We made a ton of decisions that made it a very different experience. The schedules are um, reefer than they have been in past years. Attendance at the events is obviously very different. Um, our athletes get tested at least three and typically four times a week when they're in season. And so it's, uh, it's been a journey and we still ask ourselves every day, how are we doing? Um, we get to a point given what's happening in our county right now and nationally where we, we may have to step back. Um, but right now I, I feel very good about the process and the decision. So do you, one, one question that has kind of uh, arisen is so, what was the decision making around not allowing fans to attend football games and what kind of impact is that having on the university um, or actually in St. Joe County? Well, it was a, it was a very collaborative process with uh, Dr. Fox who you had on the last show you said, who's been a, a phenomenal resource for us. But again, going back to this notion of being on campus, what we really said to ourselves was, the people who are already in community ought to be able to come to the game because they're interacting with each other already. And, and so from a health and safety perspective, that was the logical audience for us. This, by the way, is a decision no other school in the country made to, to say all students could attend if they wanted to and all faculty and staff, current faculty and staff who wanted to uh, could attend. But when we created that as our universe, both in terms of the numbers we were comfortable with, but in terms of maintaining this notion of people who are already interacting every day, we decided to cut it off at that. And so that, that became our maximum for the year. And it's, it's just students and current faculty and staff who have an opportunity to attend. And I've been, I've been really pleased with um, the, the, the reaction and, and the atmosphere we've been able to create, notwithstanding that We've got about a sixth of the, of the normal crowd there. I have to say my tickets are way better this year than they usually are. <laughs> I'm liking where I'm sitting. I don't know if I'll ever be able to go back. I think we can sell those to you next year. Yeah, like yeah I'm sure you could. I just wouldn't be able to afford them maybe. So what about the economic impact? We have some numbers on what, what it's doing to St. Joe County to not bringing all the fans in. Yeah, it's been incredibly tough on the county. I mean, the, the, so many businesses build their their budgets around that six or seven weekends a year. And if you add 
graduation to it seven or eight um, weekends a year. And to not have those has been devastating for a lot of them. And um, I, I, I hate that consequence, but um, I, I, I know the decision we made was the only one we could make in a sense. Uh, Dr. Fox was very focused on not creating a dynamic where we were inviting people from outside the area to come in, to fly in, eat at the restaurants, stay in hotels, because that, that was the most challenging dynamic to deal with. So I, I hate that consequence. From our personal perspective, despite what, or athletics perspective, despite the perceptions of, of so many people, especially in the media, the decision really had little, if any, financial consequence. It, it allowed us to capture television revenue we wouldn't have otherwise captured, but we also lose money every game now uh, that, that we open the gates because of who we chose to sell tickets to and the limited number of people. So um, on the year, it, it, had we not played at all, or if we play, doesn't look a lot different financially. Um, it's, it, it's pretty staggering in either case. Um, athletics is, uh, is an interesting business proposition in that um, we've managed to lose almost all our revenue this year, but maintain all our expenses. That's not easy to do, but we've, we've mastered it. So our highest expenses are the grant and aids for the student athletes, coaches salaries, which are under contract um, and staff salaries. We've, we've been really in, just so proud of the reaction of the staff who've made all kinds of sacrifices our highest paid employees have contributed a million and a half dollars back to the university um, from their own compensation to, to try and help us out here. Wow, that's pretty wow. amazing. So I know we're gonna use some more of our time to dig in and unpack some of those things. Like um, uh, Jackie had talked about that the protocols here at Notre Dame are actually somewhat more rigorous than in other um, locations, even comparing us to CDC, their protocols. And so we can dig into that. Um, we just wanted for a moment, we have a, a segment that we like to do called Rumor Has It. And so Marianne and I, when we're talking to our students and friends and family, they share with us the rumors or, or myths that they're hearing. And so then we like to um, ask our guests those. So we have one for each of you. And so um, for Tricia, the rumor that we have is, um, rumor has it that once the ACC and Notre Dame decided to move forward with fall competition, our students had to, comp had to compete or they would have risked losing their scholarships. Is this true or false? So that's not, not true at all. Uh, a couple of things there. So one thing is that as a university, we very, um, very tightly protect our student athletes when they come here and they receive a scholarship that we refer to as a grant and aid. That's our commitment to them that, you know, you're coming here to compete and we're going to commit whatever it is that, that is part of that scholarship agreement for the duration of your time. If a student um, were to egregiously violate team rules or were to just altogether decide they didn't want to compete in the sport, you know, that might be a basis for changing that down the road. But, but in this case, I think the early conversations that we had as a university were about honoring those grant aid agreements, even if a student didn't decide to compete because of concerns about COVID-19. And the NCAA then later in the conversation, um, sometime in August, came out and, and said to schools, you can't eliminate a student's grant and aid merely because they don't want to um, compete because they're concerned about COVID-19. So I think as a university, we made it very, very clear to all our student athletes that they had a choice here, right? That any student could say, you know what? I'm not comfortable competing um, and, and I'm gonna step back for a year and their, their scholarship would still be, they'd still be here getting their education. It was super clear, I think, to our students that they had that option. The NCA then also went ahead um, and extended the eligibility of all of our fall sport athletes, meaning that if a student chooses not to compete in the fall, th they can get that ability to compete back on the other end. They can still have four years to, of eligibility in, in the period of time that they're a student, they, you know, they don't sacrifice anything. They don't lose a season um, by choosing not to compete. So I think it's something we made really, really clear to our students is that they did have a choice. I think the vast majority of them really wanted to compete. 
And that's what we hear, right? That the students wanted to compete. Um, I'm glad you cleared up that rumor for us. Thanks, Tricia. Yeah, <clears throat> I just wanted to, to say something when I was listening to you, it's um, scholarship and grant and aid. And so th those are equivalent. It's, synonymous essentially yeah so for in the in the athletic realm we refer to the athletics based scholarship as a grant and aid a student may have other sources of, of scholarship that they could have even though they're an athlete but we refer to that as a grant and aid kind of a term of art yeah sorry mm -hmm. well th that's all right we're, we're trying to simplify the conversation <laughs> so at, at some point we'll have you uh, tell us what acc and ncaa mean <laughs> <laughs> Um, so another rumor that we've been hearing, and this is actually one I think that Jack might want to take, is now that the Big Ten is online and their testing protocols are a little bit different than the ACC, that the ACC might change their testing protocols. Is that true or false? And maybe you could talk a little bit about the differences um, of those protocols. Yeah, um, it's a great question. And boy, have we spent a lot of time on it. And, and when I say we, I'm being generous. Dr. Matt Leisler, a uh, university physician, has spent all the time on it and, and it's been, been great. Um, and I should also note that the medical advisory group is led by uh, Dr. Wolf at Duke, who has done a great job um, leading, leading that group. Um, so the Big Ten decided to do seven day a week antigen tests. Um, we also do some antigen tests on campus, as I think most of the audience knows. The antigen test is about 91% accurate, um, the data tells us to this point. The PCR test is more accurate. And so the ACC's view is that the, 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 the PCR administered effectively every other day is as good or better than the antigen test administered every day. The, 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 the real value of administering the antigen test every day, frankly, is to, sh is to shorten the quarantine period because you may catch it a day earlier. Um, but in terms of accuracy, if you consider that one out of every 10 tests may be wrong, um, we, we erred on the side of the, um, the more predictive and fr on, frankly more expensive, but, but more predictive uh, PCR test. Now, we also do administer antigen uh, on, in, in, in some situations. And interestingly, I, I think for the audience's purpose, on, on the Friday before a game, assuming we're playing on Saturday, the ACC has hired a lab which flies to the game site and tests both teams, <laughs> flies the samples back to North Carolina, processes them. We normally have the results by midnight or one in the morning. So we have a very high degree of confidence that no one taking the field um, is carrying the, the virus in a traceable way. Now we recognize there's an incubation period with the virus that no test is gonna detect. Um, but, and, and that has been our experience. Uh, as you know, we had a, 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 much as the university did with its spike, we had a spike on, relating to the football team, but all of the contact tracing in that convinced us we weren't uh, the, the disease, the virus wasn't being spread through the sport activity, through practicing or through playing. Uh, it was through sort of normal social activity among members of a team who tend to be together a lot and spend a lot of time, social time together. So does the ACC fly the night before for all fall sports or just football? Or how, how does it work for other sports? Yeah, just, just football at this point for that test, but they, the requirement uh, for the, the, the amount of testing is the same for all fall sports. The, no. the, and the reason for this, let me be clear, is that the other sports don't play on such a, a unified weekly schedule. Right. They, 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 you know, like consider basketball, for example. Um, whereas we know every weekend, unless you have a bye, you're probably playing Friday, you may be, or Saturday, you may be playing on a Friday occasionally. Uh, and so it, this process is, is sort of supported by that form of schedule in a way it can't be for most other sports. So um, let's segue and talk just a little bit about the data 
um, we want to hear a little bit about how um, uh, the testing data is integrated into um, the dashboard. But to sort of set the stage, and you've already alluded to it, Jack, is that um, the COVID cases here in St. Joe County are going up. Um, and they've been going up since we started doing this show. Um, Indiana is setting records. Um, we had in, in St. Joe County, we've got 1,568 1, active cases um, and we've had a significant increase in deaths as well. In fact, in October, we're logging our highest number of deaths. Um, I was surfing the, the headlines and finding out what's happening in other states. And um, there are dramatic increases across the United States. Uh, uh, the state of Wisconsin is now setting up field hospitals due to capacity. Uh, North Dakota, which had relatively few cases just a, a few weeks ago, has grown now so much that they've actually um, stopped doing contact tracing, that it's not yielding what it needs to do and it's totally overwhelming. So, um, you know, we're in, we're in knee deep in this. And so when I looked at Notre Dame's um, dashboard, we've actually been, it seems as though we're holding pretty steady, which is great um, at around 1.8, 2.0 um, percentage. And we're at adding a handful of cases um, every day. And of course, I know the cumulative keeps increasing, of course, and we're at about a thousand cases. How does athletics, how does their data affect or get integrated or not into the, um, uh, dashboard. It's fully integrated into the dashboard. Okay. Um, so uh, all that information, Dr. Leisler feeds it in to uh, the university process and it, it gets captured in the dashboard. Um, a few of us have access also to um, sort of a master list for athletics testing where I can see each student who's had a positive test or has been caught in contact tracing what their quarantine or isolation period is and when they'll be out. So I'm, I'm, I'm able, I didn't look at it today. I should have in, in anticipation of this, but so, so um, we're, we're checking it both that way because there's a team by team potential consequence, right? That, I, that we have to stay focused on uh, as well as making sure we're reporting fully into the university's uh, tracking and, and the contact tracing the testing, but for that one ACC test is done exactly the same way, same location. Uh, and the contact tracing is done by the university contact tracers. And, and, you know, every situation presents its own challenge to them, but you can imagine the athletics challenge, right? So the contact tracers, Dr. Leisler is involved and others, our trainers, will actually review practice video and say, okay, there's the student. Oh, now, wow. for, this, for this 90 minute practice, let's watch this student and see, you know, was he was he within six feet for 15 minutes of somebody? What did, what, what did it look like? In addition to the traditional interviewing of the student to say, who were you with? Uh, who did That's you right. spend? Because we know that recall is often incorrect, right? Not intentionally so, but it, it you know, it's faulty. Um, I don't know that I or our viewers had uh, an idea of just how in depth that contact tracing uh, is happening that you're actually reviewing video. Um, that's pretty amazing, but speaks to the fact that you're, you know, we're keeping the, the positivity and the new cases down, I suppose, right? Yeah, I've been, I've been, you know, I've been pleased that again, it's a little like a residence hall, I think, in, in the sense that you, you teams inherently are a group of students who spend an inordinate amount of time together. Um, They'll dine together. They'll they'll spend social time together. They're obviously practicing and working out together, and 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 so it does present some unique and challenging dynamics. And typically, we've had football got the most attention, but we had other teams where it it got into the team, and because of the social dynamic, despite rigorous requirements for mask wearing and social distancing, and we've changed everything about the way our facilities are laid out and the way our workouts go it's still a close-knit group and you're likely to have it spread among the members of the group. And, and that's been our experience. And at the, the risk of going on too long, there's a great article in the Atlantic about a month ago that I, I encourage the, the audience to check out. Um, it, it made the point that as we know, there are super spreader events, but they're also super spreader people. 
and that 80% of the people who contract the virus only infect one other person. 20% impact a lot of people. And, and one of the theses of this article was, we've got contract tracing backwards. We ought to be trying to find the origin of the virus you got rather than who you might have infected because that's ultimately gonna be of more help to us. It was a fascinating article. So I wonder yeah. how we would categorize ourselves, right? Am I, am I part of the 20% or the 80%? Yeah, I suppose that has a lot to do with your habits. Yes, exactly. But that, um, talking about the contact tracing, another uh, section that we do every week are the headlines. And there's been a few headlines about uh, COVID and athletics recently, but one of them um, was a Sports Illustrated article that was, the title is, I think there's a better way. Can and should college football change its approach to contact tracing? Um, and I thought maybe you guys could talk a little bit about how the contact tracing and quarantine is working with the ACC as compared to how it might work on Notre Dame's campus. And do we think that it should change? Trisha, you want to go first? Well, uh, you can correct me as, as we go through this. So the, the ACC has a um, Atlantic Coast Conference. That's our conference. ACC mm -hmm. has a, a strict 14-day rule for the close contacts, right? So it so doesn't matter how many times you test um, and how many times you test negative. Within that 14-day period, you cannot go back to your team and compete. Notre Dame's protocol, as I've seen it play out, or as I understand it, and I don't know if it's changed, is that you get your, you go into quarantine, you get a test then, you get a test on day four, you get a test on day seven. And if that day seven test is negative, if all the tests have been negative to that point, you get released from quarantine. So you could have, and in fact, I know for a fact that on one of our teams, we do have a situation where uh, a student had a, a, was a close contact of someone who had COVID. He was put into quarantine. He's out, but he still has another week before he can get back to his team because under the ACC protocol, he has a 14 day period before he can return. So, so, you know, that's an interesting dynamic where he's good to go back into the rest of the community, but we just don't allow him to go back into his, his team environment. So I do think that's a question that, that we're, we should look at and, and I've heard Dr. Leisler say, we're, we're learning a lot about it. And does that period really need to be 14 days when you have those three negative tests to that point on day seven? So you're saying that on day seven, that, that student athlete tested negative with the antigen test. Now mm -hmm. they're going back to class going to they're, the they're back in their dorm they're they're back everywhere <laughs> to where they could contract it again you know possibly or become a close contact again but meanwhile they can't go back to practice and oh. who's i was just going to ask and the 14-day guideline for the quarantine comes from the cdc that comes in 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 our case comes from the acc the the medical advisory group that that jack mentioned that's chaired by dr wolf and that dr matt leisler of our staff serves on. So, so, and Jack, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's where that comes from that 14 day, um, they're, that they're locked into that, even though we as a university have taken a different approach. Yeah, that's right. And, and it's not hard to imagine a student athlete getting contact traced, being in quarantine for 14 days, coming out of it and being a contact trace person again Yep. And going back in for 14 days, they've, they've lost 28 days and they've yep. never tested positive. Um, it's, uh, it's, it, it's a tough, it, it's a tough circumstance. And Dr. Leiser is helping to lead, I wouldn't call it a reconsideration, but a study of the data. What, 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 what does this tell us? And I, I think especially um, as we get into the winter sports, um, we, we need to really understand the quarantine data and and maybe come a little closer to, to Notre Dame's policy. So do, is that an NCAA or just an ACC policy? So like, is the Big Ten doing a 14 day quarantine? 
I don't, I, uh, yes, it's an ACC policy. Uh, each conference sets its own. I don't know what the Big Ten's quarantine policy is. What they have announced, and it's about to get tested, I think, um, is that for student athlete who test positive, it's 14 days plus a seven day reacclimation period. So it's 21 days in the wow. Big Ten. And uh, I, I, I say it may get, uh, it's probably getting visited because Wisconsin's quarterback tested positive. And uh, out of an out of a eight game schedule, he's about to miss three games. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if you remember Jack, once at women's basketball, uh, we ran into you and your wife, my, my son and I did, and he's a Wisconsin guy and he's devastated about this. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting, it's, you know, it, it, we're learning a lot, as I said, and, and, you know, from my perspective in that, especially when you're testing negative, you'll still be in quarantine, but even in quarantine, you can do a few things that keep your, your cardiovascular you know, level where it should be and maybe your flexibility. And so I'm not sure a separate seven day reacclimation period is, is necessary, but you know, every, every, every group makes its own decision. Hey, uh, Jack, could you pick up on that, uh, uh, on that comment about the, um, the cardio screen? Um, if I recall the, the schematic correctly, when somebody tests positive, they also get a cardio screen. Is that one time? Is that multiple times? How did, what, what does, what does that regimen look like? There are a series of tests that are administered. It's not just one. Um, and, and I think, and Trisha, you, you should correct me if I'm wrong on this. <laughs> I, I think it depends on how those tests go and what, what we learn from them as to whether any repeated or additional tests are, are ordered. We do an EKG, we do a, we do sort of stress test screening. We, we do a host of things that, um, that, that give us that, that reading. This has to do with the, the potential challenge of myocarditis. Um, and and this, this was a big issue early on of a lot of discussion about it. And I think what got lost in that discussion nationally was that is a risk that attends to all viruses of this nature, not unique to COVID-19. Over time, we'll, we may learn that there's more or less of a risk with COVID-19, but, but to date, it, 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 it looks like it, the risk looks comparable to other, other viruses of this nature, including some influenzas. So it's not new to us. I mean, this is a process that we've been doing for a while because we've, we've understood this risk exists. It, it surfaced in an odd way in the COVID-19 discussion, like it was a brand new discovery and that's just right right i agree i agree um i'm going to switch gears and ask a totally different question um trisha can you talk a little bit about the mask wearing policy when athletes are traveling there seems to be a lot in the headlines about if there's transmission happening on planes and while they're traveling and so forth and i wonder if you could just speak to that for a moment um, so my understanding is they're, they're masked, they're, they're on their way, they're masked when they're traveling, they're masked when they arrive. We even have a team, our volleyball team, that made a decision that it, it wanted to compete in masks and that it did not want to compete against any opponents who were not in, also in masks, right? So I, I think that um, the travel protocols are, are, are good in the sense that they're, you know, enforcing that, but it even goes to the level of, um, you know, students on sidelines before they're going into the game, they're supposed to be masked. And then um, we even have a team, like I said, competing indoors, but competing in masks, something that the ACC rules didn't require. But I think that that shows the heightened concern of that team and heightened commitment of that team uh, to really being dealt about that, that, that puts them in a position where they're, they're wearing masks, not only when they travel and when they stand on the sideline, but actually when they are in the game. So do you see like other teams and traveling, um, traveling who are not adhering to the mask policy to be wearing their masks when they're traveling, when they're interacting with Notre Dame teams? I, I don't know, Jack, maybe you've seen our visiting teams. I mean, they're complying certainly when they're in our facilities I've seen, right? 
Well, well, I can, you know, I think we all get impressions from watching television and otherwise about how some people are doing. Um, I, I could not be prouder of our team's uh, adherence and, and sort of their, 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 as you'd expect of Notre Dame students, their involvement in it, as Tricia said. I mean, the volleyball team reached out to an opponent and said, we need you to wear masks in, in yeah. competition. Um, and, and, and that's, that's very typical. They want to understand what the protocols are. They want to understand why we're doing them, but I, I can't tell you how proud I was. And I can say this cause I had nothing to do with setting it up. The travel routine for the football team this weekend to Pitt, which was the first time we traveled because our Wake Forest trip got canceled was just amazing. Um, every uh, member of the team was issued an N95 mask um, before they got on the bus. There were extra buses to take us to the plane so that you were spread out more. You were not allowed to take that mask off on the bus or on the plane. There was no food or beverage service on the plane. When we hit the hotel, there was a buffet line set up and it was staffed by our staff. Uh, Father Nate was serving food and our strength conditioning coach. So we didn't interact with the staff of the hotel. And you got effectively a a to-go container, your items were that you wanted were handed to you. You took that con to-go container, went up to your room, and that was it. Um, if mom and dad were in town to watch you play, you couldn't see them. Um, you were confined to the meeting rooms and the hotel rooms. Reversed that process in the morning, got on the bus. We had our pregame meal at the stadium in, a, in the biggest room available. Um, with plexiglass dividing all the players at the table. So it, it's the rigor of it was really fascinating to see and, and, and rewarding from my perspective. And nice to hear. And nice to hear. This is the stuff that doesn't make the papers, you know, it's not glamorous and sexy, but God, isn't it important to hear like how a team comes together and is working together to stay healthy? And um, and then, of course, to stay healthy so that they don't bring anything back to campus either or to the community. And that's just it is. It's commendable. We should probably switch gears, though, don't we? Right, Marianne? Yeah, I think it's uh, time that we take a little some questions from uh, our audience. We only have a few uh, moments. Um, and I have one, and th this is uh, from Sarah from South Bend, and she asks, how do you reconcile all of the routine testing of athletes versus the scarcity of testing in the community and the ethical considerations? People, this is just me now saying, I've heard that it's a, a week now that people getting PCR tested, getting their results back in the community, yet we get them back in a day or two? Well, um, we, we engage in that discussion a lot um, because it is an important factor for us. And we now, my own experience with uh, my son was that the delay wasn't like that. He has nothing, he's not affiliated with the university anymore. He was getting tested in South Bend and, and he had a different experience accessing uh, testing in South Bend, but we are focused on that. Now, some of, some of this testing is resources that the university's developed uh, on its own, but uh, to, to the extent our use of a lab would conflict or, or cause a critical shortage in the community would be absolutely a factor that would cause us to evaluate what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, you know, we, we've already had discussions about the vaccine in the same way. Um, we understand the priority with the vaccine needs to be elsewhere. It needs to be with the elderly. It needs to be with healthcare workers. And uh, we absolutely support that. So um, the evidence hasn't, early on, I was more worried about it, but maybe with this spike, we'll have to worry about it again. But to date, as we've talked to the county um, and the healthcare providers, we've been comfortable that the resources we're accessing weren't taking resources away from the community. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's always a moving target where we are, especially in our area right now. Um, so I have another question. This is from an anonymous attendee, and they are asking uh, where the athletes are quarantined when they're quarantined. Trisha, you want to take that one? 
Sure. So my understanding is um, so it depends whether they're on campus students or off campus students. So if they're already off campus in their own apartment or even in a shared apartment, they can be quarantined in their off campus housing. Um, for students who are on campus, obviously they have to be moved out of the dorm. There's no special region for that. They get sent where they get sent. Um, and so, you know, the university's contracted with various facilities to put students in quarantine and they would just be in that pool of students that are getting getting placed somewhere where there are beds available um, for that purpose. But so it, it's kind of a on campus or off campus thing where they're living originally. Yeah, and the thing I just stress relative to that is they're treated like any other student who's, who's either tested positive or, or identified through contact tracing. They're fed the same way, they're going to the same, um, facilities, depending upon where they're assigned and, and everything about it um, look, looks like it would if you weren't a student athlete. Let's see, so I have another one um, and this is from Tom and he's asking if Notre Dame is using electronic surveillance to track contacts like other sports are doing like you know football players being in contact or basketball players and contact tracing in that way like the, the wearables like a, a yeah. wristwatch or something we have not um we 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 use uh, a gps tracking system that we've been using for a while now which gives us some of the same insights it's not automatic where those bracelets tell you you know that's what they're focused on is measuring that. Uh, we we have not in we have not invested in those wearables, um, and and to date I, I I think between video review the data we have available to us and our contact tracing that I feel comfortable that we're getting the right answers. Um, this is just me following up on that, but hasn't Notre Dame in the past um, like did the electronic surveillance of like health? Um, of student athletes during practice and, and, and track that data? Well, we, 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 we have, um, we do, we, we have some cardio readouts, you know, the strap uh, that, that athletes wear during practice that gives us a host of measurements, the GPS trackers, which are typically worn. Um, you'll see our basketball players with a little bump in the back of their neck. That's their GPS tracker um, giving us that data. Um, that's that's been most of what we did. We experimented, I want to say three years ago now with the with the uh, bracelets that measured sleep, mm -hmm. among other things mm -hmm. um, and, and didn't feel like the data was particularly helpful. We do a daily survey of all student athletes, much like through the uh, through, through, through the here website does for all of us. but uh, we have a series of questions we ask athletes every day. It sort of feeds into the analysis of whether someone presents any any kind of risk, and then we're looking at some independent measures. So, Coach Kelly and the other coaches have a screen that they can access that has every player on it, a, a thumbnail picture of them, and they're either red, green, or yellow, and that color may be impacted by a number of things. It may be impacted by how hard they worked the yesterday, the day before, as measured by our data. It may be because their self-survey, they said they were didn't get enough sleep. And, and so we factor all that in every day to assess um, where students are and how we can make sure we're, we're, we're not doing anything that doesn't keep them healthy. Yeah, that's really great. To know. I think all students could benefit from having a team track that. But that's yeah. kind of funny. That's what I was thinking. Like when I come into the room to teach, right? In the classroom, wouldn't that be kind of cool if you could already have like that readout? So I know who maybe who hasn't had enough sleep or they need more water or, you know, whatever. Yeah, there's at least one athletic director, however, is not interested in having his weight. <laughs> <laughs> Video screen somewhere. I, I'm with you. I'm with you there. Uh, um, that's the truth. So I want to just take one more from our audience before we wrap up. And this is from okay. Karen Keyes. And she asks, how flexible and adaptable are schools regarding scheduling, guarantee fees, and reimbursement in the event that games are postponed or canceled 
due to athletes or coaching staffs testing positive right before the event? What a great and impossible to answer question. Um, <laughs> there are game contracts and sometimes the language is very helpful, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's easy to say to an opponent that you can't Western Michigan this year, for example, you know, um, in football where there's an easy opportunity for you to reschedule that game in a future year. Um, our soccer team lost the game against Virginia tech. And I spent time today and looking at proposals to try and reschedule that game. It is a massive Rubik's cube. Tricia is very involved in whether the rescheduling would impact class misses um, in any way, and she would have to sign off. She was consulted on the same soccer rescheduling I was today. Um, it, it could not be more complex. And um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure we have the answers. It's, um, it's a lot of case by case and your relationship with the other school and sort of the bigger picture of what your, your season schedule looks like. Um, and nobody, we all have to be comfortable with the fact they're going to be competitive inequities this year. And you just can't worry about it, right? Yep. Somebody mm -hmm. 27 basketball games and somebody else is going to play 18. And, and that's just the way it's going to be. And we can't worry about it. It's, it, 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 it shouldn't even be a concern. It should just be how we can keep everybody healthy. Yeah, I know, I know we're running out of time, Heidi. I just, I wanted, Tricia, so Jack mentioned the class miss policy. Mm -hmm. And people in our audience might not know about what that policy is and how we differ than other universities. Sure, so, so we start with a baseline that in every semester we ask our coaches to build their schedules so that during the regular season, they don't miss more than three classes in the Monday, Wednesday, Friday sequence and three classes in the Tuesday, Thursday sequence. So, so if there, and there's some wiggle room there and exceptions that we can bring them into the faculty board and ask them for a justification for why they want to exceed those limits. But we really do set the tone up front when you're building your schedule, you, you have to work with these parameters. And it's not just a free for all when your students can, you know, just be out of class all the time. And, and I and I said, even within an academically focused conference like the Atlanta Coast Conference, we don't see that similar policy. There's a lot more sense of the student walks into their professor and says, I'm gonna be absent nine times for sports and the professor is supposed to be okay with that. And, and I think that's really not the way that we've approached it. And the result is that we're really able to, to protect the students from, from an excess. And you know, as Jack mentioned, okay, Virginia Tech, we, we missed a soccer game, but they ended up being back in class the Monday after they should have played. So they got that class missed back. And if they miss next Monday, that's gonna be okay because that balances out, you know, those Mondays canceled each other out. So it'll work out, but something we definitely keep a close eye on. And I just wanna emphasize something Trisha just said. I have not yet found another division one institution with a missed class policy administered by the university. Um, and I find that amazing. I'm, I'm so proud we have it, but I, I, I was shocked to learn that others don't. Yeah, it is shocking. Um, so Heidi, should we start with our lightning round? Yeah, we better. Um, I just also just wanted to just uh, sort of as a, as a um, uh, an observation, as somebody who's newer to academia and Marianne has served on the faculty board, um, this has been a very enlightening conversation. I don't think that the general public or, or the average faculty member has an appreciation for um, what you and your um, groups have done to um, not only protect the, our athletes, but ensure their academic success, right? So just really hats off. This has been really enlightening and I really appreciate your time for coming on. Okay, so now we have to get to the lightning round. We just have a few questions for each of you. They're fun questions. The idea is that the audience and us get to know you just a little bit better in a different way. So we'll alternate and I'll go first. Um, the first one goes to uh, Jack. What is your superpower? That I'd like to have or that I have? That you have. Uh, an ability to function without sleep. <laughs> and Trisha, what's your superpower? Doing Rubik's Cubes, I guess. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. That is a good one. Okay, Trisha, 
What's the last show you binged and loved? I'm going Outer Banks there. Jack? Next show I binge will be the first one I binge. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay. Um, let's go to uh, uh, question three. Jack, what is your most treasured possession? My kids. Oh. Trisha? Me too. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of hard to follow up to that, right? Yeah. 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 All right. Um, Trisha, what are you deeply grateful for right now? You know, just that my family's been healthy. My mom, who's elderly, my father-in-law, who is elderly, that they've been through this and they're doing okay. And that my family has, has stayed healthy all this trying, challenging time. Yeah. Jack? Uh, me as well. And I, I would just add to it, I, 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 especially with all the craziness in our country, I feel a special privilege and gratefulness to be at a place where we can solve problems, where we can talk to each other, where we can work through issues. And, and during this pandemic, I think that's been more evident than at any time in my, in my 12 years at Notre Dame. Awesome. Great note to end on. Yeah, thank you both for uh, joining us. It's been very enlightening and um, I'm just so grateful to you both for, for sharing with us today. Um, and for our audience, um, I, we encourage you to share what you learned with your friends and your family. And if you have any suggestions about future topics or questions for our co-hosts or any rumors, please email us at consider at nd.edu. And I hope you tune in next week when we will be considering epidemiology and the Great Barrington Declaration with uh, our resident epidemiologists, Alex Perkins and Jenna Coulson. Um, thanks again, uh, Jack and Tricia. Uh, consider this, the more you know, the more good you can do. So be informed and act on an accurate information. And share reliable information with others. Until next week, be kind and give grace to each other. And, and go Irish! Go Irish.